Today, we're going to be using the concepts explored in my recent video, Orbital Mechanics 101, in order to plan a mission to Mars. Specifically, we're going to look at how long it actually takes to reach the planet Mars from the Earth, what delta V, or change in velocity, is required in order to make the trip, and there will be a bit of maths involved here, but feel free to skip ahead if you're just interested in the key result. And then we'll look at when you need to actually launch your rocket to make sure you don't miss the planet Mars, and finally, we're going to look at whether we should do a one-way trip to Mars or a return mission to Mars. So how long does it take in order to reach the planet Mars from the Earth? So what you can see here is that here we have a little diagram of the solar system, the inner solar system that we're interested in. Here we have the Sun, the Earth and Mars. Earth is orbiting from the Sun at a distance here, which I'm going to call R1, which is just one astronomical unit. And Mars is travelling in a circular orbit around the Sun at a distance that I'm going to call R2 here, which is further out from the Earth. So in order to actually reach Mars, we're not travelling fast enough when we're just sat on the Earth here. We're going to have to increase our velocity, give ourselves a little delta V, a little extra kick, which I'm just going to write here and call it delta V1. This little change in velocity will cause our circular orbit to transform into an elliptical orbit. We'll drift outwards until eventually we will be at the same distance from the Sun that Mars is at. But once we drift out to that point, our velocity isn't quite as large as the velocity that Mars is travelling around the Sun. So we're going to have to give ourselves a little extra kick, a little delta V2, in order to match velocity with the planet Mars. So now that we've set it up, we can ask, how long will we be drifting along this transfer orbit? And all we need for this is Kepler's third law. Which I discussed briefly in the Orbital Mechanics 101 video, which states that the period or the time to go around a complete orbit, measured in years, squared, is equal to the semi-major axis of the orbit, cubed. And I also told you that for an elliptical orbit, the distance between the closest point to the Sun of the elliptical orbit, which is also called the uh, perigee, and the furthest point away, which is called the apogee, so this distance from here all the way up to here, is given by 2 times by the semi-major axis. And look, we know this distance, and we know this distance already, so we know that the semi-major axis of our elliptical transfer orbit is given by the distance between the Sun and the Earth, plus the distance between the Sun and Mars, divided by 2. And remember that this is measured in astronomical units, so what we have is we're going to have 1, because the definition of the astronomical unit is that the distance between the Sun and the Earth is one astronomical unit, plus 1.52366 astronomical units, the distance between the Sun and Mars, divided by 2, which if you just put that into a calculator, you'll get 1.26183 astronomical units. So now that we know what A is, we can substitute it into Kepler's third law and take the square root, which will tell us that the period is given by, in years, 1.417 years. But the period is the time to travel around this elliptical transfer orbit and then go back all the way to the start, which is what would happen if you didn't fire this delta V2 here. But we're only travelling along half of the transfer ellipse, so we need to divide this by 2 to get the time to reach Mars. So the time to reach Mars is given by the period divided by 2, which is equal to 0.71 years, 0.71. 
which is also known as 8.5 months. Now, it's worth mentioning that in the real world, Hoffman transfer orbits can vary anything between 6 months all the way up to 8 months, and that's due to things such as Mars' orbit isn't perfectly circular, it's actually quite elliptical, which we've neglected in this calculation. There's also the influence of, say, the large gravity of Jupiter out near Mars, which has a huge effect. And there's also, I mean, there's also obviously general relativistic effects, but they're ridiculously small, so they're not even worth considering. But it's worth noting that even with all the approximations we've made, we get an answer that is extremely close to what you would see in the real world. So now that we know roughly how long it will take in order to get to Mars, I'm just going to set up a few equations that we'll need in order to tackle the next section, which is working out our delta V. So we know from the first video already what V1, the velocity that the Earth is travelling around the Sun, and V2, the velocity that Mars is travelling around the Sun, are. They're given by the velocity in a circular orbit. V1 will be the square root of g times by the mass of the Sun divided by the distance between the Earth and the Sun, where this is measured in metres this time instead of astronomical units. And the same will be true for Mars, just replacing on the denominator the distance with the distance between the Sun and Mars, R2. So we already know what V1 is, and we already know what V2 is. But that's not quite enough information in order to work out what delta V1 and delta V2 are. Firstly, let's look at the definitions of the velocities in our elliptical transfer orbit. So, when we first start off our elliptical transfer orbit, we have V1, we then add a small amount of velocity, delta V1, which puts us onto the transfer orbit, and at this point, which is the closest point in our transfer orbit to the Sun, we have what is called the, the perigee, or well, around the Sun it's also called the perihelion or the periapse, but you get the point, so I'm just going to know all of them just by VP. And when we drift out here, we're at the apogee out here. We then add a little bit of velocity in order to get V2, so in this case, the equation of interest will be, we have our velocity at apogee, which is not quite as large as V2, we then add a little bit of velocity, delta V2, and that then puts us on to the same circular orbit that Mars is at. So great, so we already know what V1 is, and we already know what V2 is, but we don't at the moment know what VP and VA are. So we're going to need two more equations in order to work out what they are. And those are given by the magical equations of conservation of energy and conservation of angular momentum. And in the next section, we're going to use them to work out what delta V1 and what delta V2 actually have to be. So what delta V is required? So these are the equations that we already have, which tell us what V1 and V2 are. But in order to work out delta V1 and delta V2, we have to know what VP and VA are. So we need two more equations. But luckily, we already know the two equations that we need from the Orbital Mechanics 101 video which are the conservation of angular momentum and the conservation of energy, which will hold along our elliptical transfer orbit until we fire engines. So in this case, the angular momentum is given by the mass of the rocket, and at the first point in the transfer orbit, we have just left the Earth, so we'll have our velocity at perihelion times by r1, and because this is conserved, it will also be equal to the angular momentum at aphelion, m times by Va times by R2. So this is our first conservation equation, but we also have conservation of energy. The energy at perihelion is given by a half times by the mass of the rocket times by the velocity at perihelion minus a potential term, g times by mass of the rocket times by the mass of the sun divided by R1. And because it's conserved, it will also be equal to a half times by the mass times by the velocity squared at aphelion this time, 
and again minus a potential term but this time we are at the orbital distance from the sun to mars r2 and so these are all we need in order to set up the problem and just work through the algebra but if you're just interested in the results in terms of how many kilometers per second you need to fire your engines feel free to skip ahead a few minutes so firstly what we can do is we can use this equation of angular momentum in order to express VP in terms of VA. So if I do that, I can cancel the mass on both sides and I can divide by R2 to get that VA is equal to R1 divided by R2 times by VP. So we've already got one result already. So the next goal will be to substitute this VA into this equation here so that we can work out what VP is. So let's do that. So if we cancel the mass all throughout this equation, the mass of the rocket, we find that a half times by VP squared minus G times by the mass of the sun divided by the distance between the earth and the sun is equal to a half. And then we substitute in VA from this expression to get R1 over R2 times by vp all squared and we still have this minus g times by the mass of the sun divided by r2 we can then bring this term onto that side in order to get vp all on its own and bring this term onto that side which tells us that a half times by vp squared minus a half times by r1 over r2 squared times by vp squared will be equal to g times by the mass of the sun divided by r1 minus g times the mass of the sun divided by r2. We can then take out a common factor of vp squared on this side and a common factor of g times the mass of the sun on this side which will tell us that vp squared and I also might as well multiply by a factor of 2 while I'm at it vp squared times by 1 minus r1 over r2 squared will be given by 2 times g times by the mass of the sun and then we're going to have a common factor of 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2 which is what we've got there. So the next step that we could do is we can simplify this expression here and this expression here by expanding the fractions. Multiply by r2 squared here to bring this onto a common denominator and multiply this by r2 and this by r1 to get a common denominator of r1, r2. And if we do that, then we learn that vp squared times by r2 squared minus r1 squared divided by r2 squared is equal to 2 times g times by the mass of the sun times by r2 minus r1 over r1 r2 but we want to get vp all on its own so we can divide bring this factor onto this side which tells us that vp squared is equal to 2 times g times by the mass of the sun times by r2 minus r1 times by r2 divided by r1 times by r2 squared minus r1 squared and it will help at this point to notice that this factor here r2 squared minus r1 squared is equal to r2 minus r1 times by r2 plus r1 and if we write it like that we can actually cancel this factor with this one on top in order to get an even simpler expression so what we learn from this is that vp squared is equal to 2 times g times by the mass of the sun times by r2 divided by r1 times by r1 plus r2 much simpler 
And then if we want to get VP, all we need to do is square root this expression. Just like that. So therefore we have an expression for VP. And in order to get delta V1 up here, all we have to do is subtract V1, which is given by this expression, from VP, which tells us that our first delta V, delta V1, is given by the square root of G times by the mass of the sun, divided by R1, times by the square root of 2 times by R2 over R1 plus R2 minus 1. So this is our first result. And if you want to get delta V2, all you have to do is substitute this result for VP into this equation here, which will tell you what VA is. And then once you know what VA is, all you do is subtract it from V2 and you'll get what delta V2 is. So I might as well write it somewhere. Let's write it here. Delta V2 is given by the square root of G times by the mass of the sun divided by R2 times by 1 minus the square root of 2 times R1 over R1 plus R2. And this here is the second result we were after. So I'll put both of these in boxes because they're the important results. So how large are delta V1 and delta V2? How much do you have to fire your rocket? So if you substitute in the standard values for G, uh, 6.67 times by 10 to the minus 11, mass of the sun, 1.988 times by 10 to the power of, oh, what's it, 30 odd kilograms, and then R1 and R2 in meters, the distance between the Earth and the sun, and the distance between Mars and the sun, you find that delta V1 is 2.94 kilometers per second, and delta V2 is slightly less, 2.65 kilometers per second. So those are the two delta Vs you need in order to reach the planet Mars. So one key issue that we need to look at is when do we actually need to launch our rocket so that we can reach Mars? Because the problem is that if we launch when Mars is here, because it takes us seven or eight months to drift out here, Mars will then be somewhere else in its orbit and we'll miss the planet entirely. So the question is, whereabouts should Mars be along its orbit when we're ready to launch? So, what we're asking is what is this angle here between Earth and Mars, which I'm going to call using the Greek letter theta. So in order to work out that, we know that it takes us eight and a half months to drift out along our elliptical transfer orbit. This one here. So the question is, how far will Mars move around its orbit during those eight and a half months? So what we can do is we write a ratio that the time that we spend going around divided by the period of Mars's orbit around the Sun, how long it takes Mars to go all the way around 360 degrees, will be given by the ratio between this angle here, which is the angle that Mars actually moves between those two points in time, which will be 180 degrees minus theta, 180 minus theta, divided by the total angle all the way around the orbit, 360 degrees. So we know that the time it takes us to drift around here, this t, is given by eight and a half months, which in years is 0 0.71 years. So 0 0.71 years divided by the period of Mars, how long it takes Mars to go all the way around, which is 1.88 years, which you can work out from Kepler's third law. And this is given by 180 minus theta divided by 360. So if you multiply by 360, add theta to this side, subtract this to that side, then what you find is that theta will be 44 degrees.
So you have to launch your rocket when Mars is 44 degrees ahead of the Earth in order to make sure that you don't miss Mars. Great, so now we know when to actually launch our rocket. So the final thing to look at is we've only looked at how you would actually reach Mars. What about returning from Mars? And so what I'm going to do is a really quick automatic calculation is to work out basically what the difference would be in the fuel requirements between a one-way mission versus a return mission. And to do this, I'm going to use something called the rocket equation, or, or C.L. Tovsky's uh, rocket equation in full, which tells us that a delta V, so previously we've talked a lot about delta Vs, but not how a delta V actually relates to the fuel that you burn. And this equation tells you that. So delta V is given by VE, where this here is the exhaust velocity, the velocity of whatever you're firing out the back of your rocket, times by the natural logarithm, and there's a minus sign here, of the final mass of your rocket divided by the initial mass of your rocket. And so this is a very, very important equation. And just to illustrate that, if I rearrange this equation to get what the final mass divided by the initial mass is, using the inverse function of the natural logarithm, I find that the final mass over the initial mass is given by E, the exponential function. It's, it's just a number. It's like 2.71 or so, to the power of minus delta V over the exhaust velocity. Now, what this equation tells us is that, let's say, in order to get back from Mars, we have to use the exact same delta Vs that it took us to get to Mars. So we're going to say that the delta V we need is going to go up by a factor of 2. What this equation tells us, if we substitute in uh, what E actually is, is it tells us that the ratio between the final mass and the initial mass has to go down by a factor of 7.4. So what this means in layman's terms is that if you want to get to Mars and then get back uh, to the Earth, then you need to carry seven times more fuel in order to get the exact same payload to Mars. What advantages or disadvantages can you think of about one-way missions to Mars versus return missions to Mars? Let me know in the comments below. If you missed the first part of this video, Orbital Mechanics 101, you can check it out over there on the right in the featured videos. The other featured video is a brand new conversation with six Australian Mars One candidates, which is excellent, so be sure to check it out. The next video on this channel in about a week's time will be on the search for a second Earth a habitable exoplanet, which is very exciting and is the field that I want to do my PhD in. Well, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it, and until next time, I'll see you then.